Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. Today, we're mixing things up a little. I'm joined by four of my Crisis Group colleagues to take you through how the novel coronavirus is shaping politics and diplomacy throughout The Horn. From Sudan to Tanzania, the coronavirus pandemic has already delayed elections, endangered political transitions, and tested leaders, diplomats, and governments as they've struggled to adapt. In this episode, our analysts will talk you through what's happening on the ground in Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, Kenya, Tanzania, and South Sudan, and what to look out for in the coming weeks and months. We're going to start over with you, William. Uh, This is William Davison, our senior analyst for Ethiopia. Um, and he's in Addis Ababa right now. Actually, William, I believe you're our first repeat guest on the Horn of Africa podcast. So great to have you back on. Thank you very much. And what an honor. (laughs) A huge honor, a huge honor. So we've already seen an election delay uh, due to this COVID-19 in Ethiopia. um, And the government recently just declared a state of emergency. So how do you expect all of this to affect what was already an extremely complex political transition uh, in the country that, that we've talked about previously. Yes, that's, that's right. So it's had an, an immediate and significant political um, effect here, really changing the dynamics. Um, I mean, it, it, essentially, you know, the government, the electoral board was already struggling to meet the electoral schedule for a 29th of August vote. Um, and there were also lots of opposition complaints and generally fears of um, that the um, election would be um, would, would, would feature violence. Um, so what the pandemic has done, um, you know, obviously a massive threat to the nation, but also the perfect excuse really um, to delay and press pause on this electoral process. Um, now the focus is going to be on um, tackling COVID-19 and there's signs of a decent amount of solidarity there from amongst the political actors. But The one thing that this um, delay has done is push Ethiopia past uh, what is perceived to be the constitutional deadline for elections. And therefore it's pushing, um, or it's likely to push this government um, into staying in power beyond its five year term limit. So there are lots of issues to be resolved around that, um, which is going to be, you know, ideally would be sorted out in consultation with the opposition. Um, The first order of business is to um, is to you know, get some sort of consensus on the state of emergency conditions. And then people need to work out with what sort of authority um, the government will be um, governing after its um, term limit expires. And particularly, you know, how is that going to work legally and constitutionally when it comes to removing the state of emergency after the pandemic subsides and the government oversees the elections? It's just not clear we're moving into somewhat you know, constitutionally unprecedented territory there. You said that in some ways the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, provided an excuse to delay the elections. Could we see uh, this actually prove beneficial or at least an opportunity, politically speaking? Yes, and I I should be a bit more careful with my my language there. It's not that it isn't justified, of course, to delay the election. It would be hugely irresponsible to, to, you know, to run an election campaign with all that human interaction um, in the midst of a pandemic. So, you know, there was an obvious need, um, pressing need to delay the election. Um, but I think what's happened here is that, you know, during Ethiopia's transition, um, they have sort of tried to abide by the constitutional regular procedures and, and schedules, when actually really it's a kind of extraordinary political situation in many ways. One of the effects of that has been is, is that there hasn't really been enough time um, to take all of the measures that are needed and and to see all the improvements that are needed to create the conditions for a fair and competitive election. So for example, you know, we have a significant new electoral law, we have a, you know, significantly um, new electoral board, Um, we have a lot of opposition parties that have returned to the country, we have a media and a civil society that are relatively unshackled, also attempts to improve things like um, the independence of the judiciary. Now ultimately, you know, partly because of the turmoil we've had in Ethiopia, but really, there hasn't been the sorts of improvements and developments in all of these kind of broad aspects of the democratic system that we would have liked to have seen in place and to have made progress before 
embarking on what's likely to be a, you know, a, a highly competitive election. We, we need a system that can sort of withstand the stresses that comes from that. What this delay does is give everyone a little bit of extra time working on their internal preparations, um, but also in terms of getting these broader aspects of the democratic system in place, the electoral board, the judiciary, and, and that type of thing. So this extra time does provide the opportunity for that also some additional time for uh, much needed negotiations between the ruling party and the opposition as well. Now, we haven't seen Ethiopia quite declare the same levels of lockdown that we've seen in some of the other countries in the region. I'm wondering exactly why. I think the concerns there are about the um, the prevalence of um, poverty and low-income workers in Ethiopia who are essentially on a, you know, operating a, a, in a subsistence manner. So they're on a day-to-day survival. So the concern there is that if there is a severe um, lockdown, a strict lockdown to try and contain the spread of the virus, then people automatically or very, very quickly would be running into, in, into difficulty to try and feed themselves. Um, and that's why I think the government is, is trying to pursue other options um, because of that, you know, just not seen as a, as a very practical way to, to proceed. And, and also the difficulty of, of implementing um, that type of comprehensive lockdown as well. All right. Uh, thanks, Will. OK, thank you very much. Now, let's move over to Sudan, which, of course, has its own political transition going on. We have Jonas Horner with us, deputy director of our Horn of Africa team and our senior Sudan analyst. Jonas, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Alan. So what worries you the most about how this COVID-19 pandemic might affect Sudan politically? I imagine right now the Sunni's transition, of course, is, is quite fragile, and we've had a lot of concerns about whether or not the new transitional government can boost the economy enough to really make this whole thing work. Well, that's right. I mean, I, my main concern really is the added pressure on the political economy of the country that comes from this COVID-19 impact. Um, already, the country, as you've said, is really under real stress economically. And, you know, so much of the civilian governments the transitional governments, uh, civilian component, uh, so much of their credibility relies uh, on their uh, ability to uh, to illustrate that it can respond adequately to the needs of, of ordinary uh, Sudanese c- civilians. And, uh, and, and, you know, this is very important given that we are in this transitional moment moving away from the uh, 30 years of Omar al-Bashir and, and, and towards elections that are slated for, for 2022. Since COVID-19 has come to Sudan, um, there have been 14 cases tested positively, certainly um, 199 suspected and plenty more expected, only two deaths. Um, but uh, in that time, food prices have tripled. Uh, and that, of course, um, is particularly problematic in a country where people live close to the bone and really need to get out uh, into the streets to interact, to um, ply their trades, to make the money that allows them to bring home food for their for their families. You know, containment is very hard there because people really need to go out um, to, to make that money. Uh, in, in Atbara, for example, um, just north of Khartoum, there's already been a, a protest by tea sellers who have been uh, unhappy with uh, uh, the order to be told to stay home, and and, and they expected um, uh, that they would receive some compensation from the government uh, for their for, for their acquiescence to that to that order. I think you know one particular concern though as well are uh, at a macro level are uh, the impact of uh, is the impact of this uh, squeeze on government resources and international resources, for example peace agreements, uh, the peace uh, talks that are going on in Juba between the Sudanese government and armed groups from Darfur and South Kordofan and Blue Nile. Um, and, and uh, you know, these rely, being able to get that agreement done relies heavily on being able to have the money to uh, pay for disarmament programs, to bring uh, ex-combatants into the fold and to reform the security sector. So um, all of this points to a real uh, fragility with, within Sudan, its inability already uh, to address, uh, you know, to bring in commodities, crucial commodities like flour, sugar, diesel, fuel, all of that is, is, is far more squeezed all of a sudden. The government only has about a month worth of foreign exchange reserves to be able to cover um, uh, that the import of subs- of commodities, um, uh, and, and that's uh, the sub- lifting of subsidies is its own issue. Now, throughout all this, we've seen General Hameti and the Rapid Support Forces basically doing their own uh, propaganda and acting um, on their own, basically within the state. Uh, they built this big new uh, 
hospital and they produce this <laughs> somewhat hilariously slick video showing off this the the new hospital that they opened and and proclaiming that they're the ones really fighting this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, do you think we've learned anything thus far just through that and other ways on how the government has responded about what this power sharing arrangement actually is in Sudan and who really holds the power? Yes, well, well that episode in particular shed um, a, a rather interesting bit of light on the power dynamics within the transitional government. As you said, General Hameti and his rapid support forces did set up a, a 200 bed uh, facility just uh, north of Omdurman, which is itself north of, of, of Khartoum, um, equipped very specifically to treat uh, COVID-19. Um, you know, I think the, the power dynamic that's most curious and interesting here is that, you know, the video you mentioned and, and all of the press releases around this facility all brand it very much as an RSF initiative. And, and this comes along, uh, is very much in line with previous uh, initiatives that the RSF has taken to work in east of Sudan to, to work on uh, various uh, diseases like malaria and um, and uh, to, to, to try to be really a legitimate actor here. And I think this really shows um, Hameti's hand in terms of his interest in being taken seriously on his own merits. And, and unfortunately, the collateral effect is that that undermines the credibility of the transitional government, which is so precious uh, at this moment as they try to both uh, illustrate to Sudanese that they're uh, a viable uh, a, a viable. Go governance force within the country um, and uh, and as the country tries to move itself towards 2022 elections. All right. Thanks, Jonas. Thank you, Al. And now we're going to go over to Omar Mahmoud, our senior analyst for Somalia. Um, Omar, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Alan. Great to be here. Uh, so Somalia, of course, has scheduled elections this year. I'm wondering how important are those elections? And I imagine that the COVID-19 a uh, crisis is is making the politics around those elections uh, even more complicated. Yeah, absolutely. And and those were really supposed to kick off by the end of this year and culminate in the selection of a new president or or the re-election of the current one by February of, of next year. So there's a bit of time, but that process was already incredibly complex for, for a number of reasons. Uh, the environment's highly charged right now and, and some key actors aren't working together. The, the timelines, even though there is a bit of time, there are extremely tight and some of the technical work is already falling behind. And e even questions about the process. The government continues to insist on a universal suffrage process uh, for these elections, but that appears a remote prospect for, for a number of reasons. And there is a new electoral law on the books, uh, but there has some, some loopholes, some uncertainties in it as well. And it would be almost impossible to fulfill already without greater cooperation between some key actors in, in, in Somalia. And so here I refer to, for example, the tensions between the center and periphery, so Mogadishu and the, and the federal member states. So we, we throw corona on top of this, and, and it adds a layer to a very complicated process already. And, uh, you know, the electoral law, uh, the, the, the law in the books, the, the recent law does provide um, room for delay and it, it, it's a little unclear and it gives some wide um, room to parliament there. Uh, but, but beyond that, I think the issue is that there must be some sort of level of, of consultation and consensus for this to happen. And, and so we'd have to see a greater sort of um, cooperation from these political actors that aren't really working together right now. I think there's a real risk that if, if the government pushed ahead with some sort of uh, unilateral process that it could really inflame tensions quite strongly. Um, so, I th so I think we'll be watching that closely, but really trying to urge that uh, however corona affects this process, that, that there's a, a level of, of stakeholder engagement around that. And even if there is some sort of a delay or, or some sort of a effect on the time process, that uh, actors can use that time wisely to, to uh, make up some of the gaps, especially on the technical level that we've seen thus far. Now, another aspect uh, of all this is is how this affects right now what is really kind of the main state-building question that Somalia faces, which is you have this federal government, Mogadishu, and then you have all these federal member states with various levels of autonomy from that government and various levels of relations with that government in Mogadishu. And so I'm wondering if an outbreak does hit, how would you see that possibly playing out in terms of either uh, strengthening those relations and maybe in some ways increasing coordination between between the federal government and the member states, or in fact making that divide even worse? 
Yeah, so I mean, I mean, Corona is clearly a, a major challenge and, and a major um, sort of unprecedented challenge facing the world, but clearly Somalia as well. And and you can really see this happening, uh, you know, in any sort of crisis, there's there's an opportunity. And so there's that opportunity for greater coordination, given that to, to face a threat like Corona, you really do need to coordinate. It's, it's imperative to be able to, to face that challenge. And so that's coordination, you know, on, on a number of different levels, we have some, some existing fault lines in, in Somalia. So between the center and the periphery, as you mentioned, um, already also between um, Somalia and, and Somaliland, which is broken away uh, and, and, and not doesn't recognize uh, being part of, of Somalia as well. Uh, so coordination along those lines would be really important. Uh, but at the same time, this type of crisis also provides an opportunity for those who want to distinguish themselves uh, by undertaking different policies, by maybe not coordinating, and by, by implementing different sort of responses to uh, this, this type of issue. And we've seen that happen in the past, for example, with regards to foreign policy, with federal member states making different uh, foreign policy initiatives that, than Mogadishu. And their ability to kind of undertake those and implement those really provides an opportunity to distinguish themselves within relation to the federal government. So, so you know, I think right now, maybe because the spread hasn't been as high, even though we're seeing some worrying indications, especially this week, maybe that political imperative to work together hasn't been as strong. And maybe that'll increase going forward, because I think we're still seeing some sort of politicization of the response, uh, some bickering going back and forth over sovereignty issues between between um, uh, Somalia and Somaliland, for example, um, maybe not great degrees of coordination with, with some of the federal member states still in terms of their response. So we're still seeing that politicized aspect, uh, but would really urge, especially as this outbreak continues, uh, rather than using that as an opportunity to distinguish yourself, use it as an opportunity to overcome some of these pre-existing divides, at least for this specific aspect. Uh, because without that, you know, I, I think, um, really, the, the situation could be quite, quite severe. Now, before we let you go, of course, we have to ask you, I think, about what would happen if this virus spreads into Al-Shabaab territory, which is a question many people are asking. And of course, that's also related to the fact that people remember what happened during the Somali famine in 2011, where Al-Shabaab basically didn't allow famine relief into its territory. And, you know, the U.S. also made it very difficult for, for aid groups to actually provide aid in, in Al-Shabaab territory. What do we think might play out this time um, from Al-Shabaab side and from possibly a donor community side if we do have the virus spread there too? You know, thus far, the indications we've seen from, from Al-Shabaab, they haven't commented on corona specifically with regards to Somalia too much. Uh, but in one statement, they did put out a little bit of messaging, blaming it on, on the spread of external actors, or the presence of external actors in, in Somalia. So I think we see, you know, from a messaging standpoint, how they might try to leverage that in, in uh, coordination with some of their objectives, which is the removal of foreign uh, presence and foreign troops on Somali soil. Uh, but, I, but I think operationally, Al-Shabaab would need to be a little bit careful here, and specifically for the issue you just raised. Their response to the famine in 2011 was disastrous uh, and, and, and cost lives and, and really in, down the line also cost Al-Shabaab some, some popular support, some civilian support. But COVID clearly requires some sort of different uh, response and, and something that would be beyond Al-Shabaab's capabilities if there was a true outbreak there. So I think they have to tread a little carefully as well because you can't really de-link that question without considering Al-Shabaab's relationship with the civilian population and how they're a little bit on their heels already. They've taken some backlash because of some of their some of their attacks, uh, especially in Mogadishu, that have had very high civilian casualty rates. Uh, so, and, and you know, they've brought this up in their messaging time and time again about civilian casualties. So you can see it, it it's clearly an issue and a vulnerability to them in, internally as well. So I think how they calculate their response will very much have to take that into account as well. Uh, but I, I think, you know, the fact that they've been a little bit quiet maybe shows that they're still thinking about this and trying to figure it out. And, you know, the, the question about this being in, in Somalia is a little different than if the outbreak is in specifically areas where they are present and they're really governing. Omar, thanks for coming on our podcast. No, thanks for having me.
Now let's go over to a couple other countries in the region, and we're going to you, Maron. This is Maron Alias uh, joining us from Nairobi. She's our researcher in the Horn of Africa team. Uh, Maron, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Alan. Now, Kenya, uh, let, let's start with there. Um, this is by most measures the region's strongest democracy. Um, what, what effects is COVID-19 having politically there? And, and how is the government coping with the terrible dilemmas this crisis brings? So Kenya has declared 191 cases of coronavirus and the, the government is trying to take some some serious measures to stop the spread of the virus. Um, recently, Nairobi and the counties on the coast went on a partial lockdown. You also need to wear a face mask in all uh, public spaces now. But despite this, there's still reasons to worry. Um, the Kenyan healthcare system is simply not ready to tackle a significant uh, spread of the virus because... There are inadequate resources for such a large population. The Kenyan government is also worried about the economy. Several key sectors uh, have seen a slowdown because markets around the world are closing and demand is also dropping. Uh, remittances, which are the biggest source of forex, are expected to drop. A sharp drop in tourism is also expected and that will have significant consequences on Kenya because it's a sector that generates over a billion dollars per year. Another good example is also the flower industry because it's been throwing away thousands of flowers uh, given the lack of buyers in Europe and uh, that's at a loss of two million dollars per, per day. So how is this affecting life inside Nairobi now that the government has effectively tried to quarantine Nairobi from the rest of the country? So President Kenyatta explained last week that a full lockdown would only be a last resort for Kenya because large uh, segments of the Kenyan population, especially the urban poor, uh, are either employed in, inf- in the informal sector or depend on daily incomes to survive, and they simply cannot afford a lockdown. So a significant slowdown of activities could actually cause some serious social unrest in, in Nairobi. Uh, the scenes we saw from the first day of the curfew perfectly illustrate that since uh, the police brutally enforced the curfew on people who had gone to work and then were unable to make it back home early enough. Um, unfortunately, it also speaks to the potential for police impunity during this time. Uh, we've gotten reports that uh, crime could be on the rise uh, because the police is uh, focusing on implementing measures to halt the spread of the virus. And as much as that is a problem, it can also mean in turn that the police can interpret directives from the government and use violence to enforce the rule of law. And lastly, let's turn to Tanzania, a country uh, where we've really seen political space close up and where elections are scheduled for October. Uh, how has this affected how the government has responded so far to this crisis? So Tanzania has only declared 32 cases of uh, coronavirus so far. And in the beginning, the government adopted a very lax attitude towards the crisis, even though they know that the country does not really have the resources to handle a large outbreak. Um, This was very worrying for neighbors like Kenya or Rwanda uh, because they share porous borders with the country. And Tanzania has has a bad history of poorly dealing with epidemics in 2019, For example, they tried to hide cases of Ebola, and that's quite serious. But uh, since the numbers uh, have been going up, the government seems to be implementing new measures every day. Um, Schools are closed, large gatherings are also banned, but there's still no curfew or lockdown, and this can have devastating consequences in the context of large cities such as Dar es Salaam, where almost three-quarters of residents live in informal settlements. And those are quite conducive to transmission. At the same time, the government's decision to not implement a lockdown can be understood. It's it's tightly linked to the economy. Um, China is Tanzania's largest trading partner, and the effects of the virus on Beijing are being felt by Tanzanian traders. Um, the tourism sector is also going to be highly affected because people are canceling plans, changing plans. But at That's a sector which is a top forex earner for Tanzania, and some places like Zanzibar totally depend on it. If you think about the mining sector, which is also quite big in Tanzania, the country will not be able to count on gold exports because um, even though it's the fourth largest gold producer in Africa, prices have significantly dropped uh, since borders closed.
Um, you talked about the elections earlier and the pandemic comes at a time where tensions are actually quite high already in Tanzania. Um, since Magufuli came, like since President Magufuli came to power in 2015, uh, there has already been a decline in political and civil rights uh, in Tanzania. And unfortunately, the government could take advantage of this crisis to further um, crack down on the media and the opposition. And if indeed um, they do that, if President Magufuli exploits this crisis for political gain, it could create protests and serious social unrest down the line, um, especially in places like Zanzibar, which, are, which is a hotbed of opposition to the ruling party. All right, finally, let me say a few words about South Sudan. As many of you know, I am also Crisis Group's senior analyst for South Sudan. First of all, I think when it comes to South Sudan, we need to all recognize, as is the case in many of these countries, but I think um, is, is worth really repeating on South Sudan, that, you know, our main concern is humanitarian. South Sudan is a country that essentially doesn't really have a healthcare system. Um, almost all of the healthcare that's provided comes from NGOs, uh, usually, and aid groups, uh, with, with some few exceptions. And not only that, but you have a situation where you still have hundreds of thousands of South Sudanese who are living in the protection of civilian camps in really close quarters. These are the IDP camps that are protected by the UN. I mean, this itself is just a huge dilemma. These are essentially petri dishes for the virus if it spreads there. And yet, you know, you can't really force people to to leave. And, and where would they go? Um, there, you know, areas in South Sudan don't really have services. And this population itself could already have the virus and then spread it, you know, around South Sudan in rural areas. Um, you could also imagine situations in which, you know, wherever the virus does spread, we're going to see a very securitized response from the government because that's how the government responds to, to most crises. And so you could imagine violence and abuse and forcible quarantines. You could imagine situations in which areas are, are cordoned off, uh, people aren't allowed to come and go, and uh, basically NGOs and WFP are asked to come in and take care of the people and feed them and keep them alive. It, you know, if, a, if there is a humanitarian crisis on a large scale in South Sudan, at the same time that this hits other parts in the region and other parts of the world, the, the, the normal agencies that respond to disasters and respond to famine and other similar situations would, of course, be really, really overstretched and in a really difficult donor environment and might not be able to respond in the same way that they, that they normally would. So, so obviously in South Sudan, there, you know, there are very worrying scenarios, also questions of you know, if people are fleeing a humanitarian crisis in South Sudan, will they be allowed to cross the border as refugees or will countries basically block off borders? You know, I think there, there's really fundamental questions about how some of this would work if a crisis did come that, um, you know, that are difficult to answer and quite scary to think about. You know, on the other question and, and the one that, you know, I discussed with with most of our other analysts on this episode is what happens on a political level. Um, and on that level, I think it's actually a, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, first of all, everyone should feel a lot of relief that they formed this unity government at the end of February, right before this hit. And, and that's especially true uh, because, as I discussed with Ambassador Maboub Malim in the previous episode to this one, you know, EGAD is basically in deep freeze and we're unlikely to see any serious diplomatic push uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis anytime soon. All the heads of state who are sort of required in this ritual of calling these summits and then getting, you know, the, the two warring sides in South Sudan to, to sit down and, and talk to each other in front of the other heads of states, that whole ritual is just not going to be able to take place for a very long time. The more likely scenario here is clearly that every leader in the region is going to be focused on their own internal crises. And that, you know, the the pressure that has always been needed to sort of get this peace process to move forward is is not going to be there. Um, so I think that, you know, the far more likely scenario in South Sudan is that this probably 
does sort of stall the peace process um, as it's likely to to stall processes um, around the region. And of course, um, if it does stall, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the government or the peace deal immediately collapses. But obviously, the more discontent spread, spreads around in a country as fragile with the history that South Sudan does, you know, sooner rather than later, we'll see renewed violence in, in parts of the country. So, so that's obviously a you know, one of the concerns that's that's there when it comes to how COVID-19 might, might affect South Sudan politically. Thanks for listening. We will be back next week with another episode examining the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect on the horn. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell, and this podcast is produced by Mae Francis for the International Crisis Group. 